All right, if you take your Bibles and open to the book of First Thessalonians. So this morning, we're going to be in Thessalonians chapter 2, but I owe you a quick explanation and an admission of a mistake on my part. So before we get into this, I want to kind of make sure that those of you that say, oh, Steve, you you were doing this last week. Well, let me explain what I did. Um, uh, And and hopefully you can just forgive me. We can move on from my little mistake. Um, Most of you probably don't know this, but I'm typically preparing two sermons at a time. I'm working on the sermon for the Sunday that's coming, and I'm working on the sermon for the Sunday that's coming afterwards, okay? So I'm doing two sermon preparations at the same time, which is not a problem. This is my regular pattern, which is no it's the way I, I study and I enjoy it. It's, it's good for me. Well, I did a first-time mistake last Sunday, right? I had the sermon for 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 16, and I printed my notes for 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 3, 10. And so if you notice, when I started to go through my notes last week, I had this really long pause because I couldn't figure out where I was at in the passage. That's why. I couldn't figure out where I was at. I, was, I had the wrong notes printed. So uh, we got the sermon last week for 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through chapter 3, 10. So I'm going to go back and actually give you the sermon that I had prepared for 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 16. All right, so now you know my mistake. Hopefully, you can forgive me and we can move on. (laughs) If not, you can rub it in my face for the years to come, and, and, well, I suppose I deserve it for something else anyway. Yeah, maybe God wanted me to do that. Sure, yeah. Maybe God just wanted me to normalize Roger's whole life. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. I only said that because you said you weren't going to let it go. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll uh, read again in verse 1. Scripture says this, for you, know, for you yourselves know, brothers, that our visit with you was not without result. On the contrary, after we had previously suffered and we were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. For our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but rather God who examines our hearts. For we never used flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives. God is our witness. And we didn't seek glory from people, either from you or from others, Although we could have been as a burden, I'm sorry, although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles. Instead, we were gentle among you as a nursing mother nurtures her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preached God's gospel to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you, with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each of you, or each one of you, to walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is why we constantly thank God because when we received the message about God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as, a, but as it truly is the message of God which also works effectively in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country just as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved." 
As a result, they are always completing the number of their sins, and wrath has overtaken them at last. So we see here the Lord reminding, uh, through Paul, reminding the Thessalonians of their gospel coming to them and of the way that it came to them. Now, for those of you who have um, short-term memory problems, welcome to my world, okay? Um, I want to remind you of a little bit of the Thessalonian background, okay? So Paul was in Ephesus and um, the, there, there was a slave girl who had a demon in her and the, she, the, her owners made money off of the demon in her, okay? And then uh, Paul cast the demon out. The owners lost their income and so they lied about Paul, created a riot, and had Paul beaten and then thrown in prison, uh, which was illegal because he was a Roman citizen. He could not be beaten or thrown in prison without a trial. Well, anyway, that, that was when the, uh, the God came and opened the jail doors and the jail cells, but nobody left. And so Paul and his friend Silas, who had been praising the Lord after being beaten and, and were in prison, and by the way, just in my opinion, he probably was off key. He probably wasn't singing well, okay? He was, he was a bookworm. Paul was a, a highly educated individual, and he probably didn't have the gift of singing, all right? But he was praising God anyway. Right? The Bible doesn't say that. That's just my opinion, all right? Um, but anyway, uh, and... Uh, so the Philippian jailer invites him to his house and says, you know, I want to hear more of this. The whole family comes to Christ. Paul and Silas go back into the prison, and then in the morning when they're supposed to be released, they say, no, you can't release us. You've, you've committed a crime, and you must come and make it right. And so the city leaders come and apologize and walk them out of the city with some sort of fanfare to try and make like, hey, everything's okay here. So Paul and Silas being freshly beaten and freshly coming from prison where they were in torture stocks traveled through a couple towns and wound up in Thessalonica. So they were slightly still recovering from the bruises and the beating and the pain and they get to Thessalonica and they find a welcome reception for this message, right? And... uh, this is what Paul is speaking here of here, but along with that came some persecution because the Thessalonian uh, Jews were very angry that Paul and Silas were leading some away from the Jewish religion, which is actually not true. They were completing the purpose for the Jewish religion, but they, the Jews who didn't believe felt betrayed, and they, they uh, brought a, created a riot, brought it to the house of Jason, and when, the, uh, Paul, when, when uh, Paul and those with him were not found by the rioters in Jason's house, Jason was taken out. As a local businessman, he was taken out and beaten in the street. So the people in Thessalonica did experience persecution Uh, with the gospel. They saw it with Paul and with Silas coming from the beating they had taken, and they saw it within their own church, people being physically assaulted and beaten for the sake of the gospel. So when Paul starts here and he says, we know that our brothers, that our our visit was, was not without result. On the contrary, after we had previously suffered The Thessalonians knew that they had suffered. They saw the results of their suffering. They said, after we had suffered, and we were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. Wait, did I say Ephesus? I meant Philippi. Regardless. He said, outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel to you in spite of great opposition. So they had great opposition in speaking the gospel, but God gave them boldness. You say, well, wasn't Paul just a bold guy? Well, let's, let's remind ourselves of what the apostles went through, right? If you look in Acts chapter 4, right, this is where the apostles are, are speaking of Jesus Christ and how, how, he, how his kingdom is coming and how he's ready to forgive those who crucified him if they're willing to trust in him and turn to him. Um, and, the, and yet the Jewish leaders aren't happy about this. So we see in Acts 4.23, we see this. After they were released... So they were arrested by the Jewish leaders. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders said to them. When they heard this, they all raised their voices to God and said, Master, you are the one who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. 
You said to the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our, your, your, our father, David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers assembled together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your slaves may speak your message with complete boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing signs and wonders to be performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and, and began to speak God's message with boldness. Did you catch that, that, that reading between the lines there that the disciples were afraid of what was going to happen to them when, when they disobeyed the command of the Jewish leaders? They knew that bad stuff was coming, and so they said, God, give us the boldness to proclaim the message you've given to us in spite of the threats that have been made and the pain that is coming not only to us but also to our loved ones. And God answered their prayer and gave them that boldness. And so we see here that Paul, as he's saying, that God gave them the ability to speak the message of the gospel with boldness in spite of the opposition. Interesting fun fact for you, we tend to think that sharing the gospel is all on me. I just got to do it. I got to be brave. I got to be bold. I got to open my mouth. I got to say something. After all, if I don't, who will, right? Nothing wrong with that thinking. But what about God's power at work in you? What about the example of the apostles? And Paul here in Thessalonica who said it was God's strength that gave me the ability to speak the message with boldness. How often do we say, God, I need your strength to give your message to the people you want to hear it? Well, it's so much less on me. Now I get to... Now I get to go in the power of God's spirit and know that when he wants me to speak, he's going to open my mouth. Isn't that a lot more freeing than just the pressure being on me to have to say something and otherwise I'm a bad Christian who doesn't love God? You say, but Steve, how are we supposed to do that? Well, we can follow the apostles' examples. The people that walked with Jesus prayed that God would give them the boldness they needed. Then he says in verse 3, our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but rather God. So they didn't <coughs> have um, error or impurity or intent to deceive with the message they gave. They just gave God's message. It was God's words, not their words. When he says we speak to please God, Right? The apostles also addressed this once again in Acts 4 when they were speaking to the Sanhedrin who had, thre who had threatened them. Peter and John answered the Sanhedrin and said, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. <clears throat> and so once again, what is, it, what, what is it we speak? We don't speak to please man. We speak to please God who examines our hearts, right? John 12 says this in verse 44. It says, Jesus cried out, said, the one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't accept my sayings has this as his judge, 
the word I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his command is eternal life, so the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Do you know how to know that you're not speaking from error or impurity or intend to deceive, but you're just speaking to please God? Speak God's words. Your own don't matter. You say, well, what are my words? Well, the ones you say, well, I think this. In my opinion, this. Or when we have our less humble moments, we say, well, if those if that individual or if those people just had a brain to think the right way, then they'd agree with me. Those are our less humble moments, but you know we've all had those, right? What is your point? My point is we have so many opinions about why I think this and why I think that and why I'm right here and why you're wrong there. You speak God's words, guess what? They're not arguing with you. By the way, I just want to note, want you to note, God's words can be spoken out of context. And God's words spoken out of context are just as dangerous as you giving your opinion. You say, what, are, what do you mean out of context? Well, you may have heard of this method. If you haven't, that's fine. But there's a method of Bible study that says, you know, I don't know what to read. I don't know where to read. So I'm just going to open the Bible. I'm going to point to a verse. I'm going to read it. And that's God's verse for me for the day. That's not a horrible thing. All right, if you're trying to learn from God, but, but, imagine this scenario with me. I'm going to quote some verses from Scripture. Imagine you open your Bible and you, and you point to a verse and it says, Judas went out and hung himself. That's a verse in the Bible, is it not? Judas went out and hung himself. You, you, you know what? That is not a good verse for me today. So you open your Bible to another verse and it says, you go and do the same. That's also another verse in the Bible. Not next to Judas hung himself, but it's another verse in the Bible that says, you go and do the same. You're like, this isn't stacking up for me so well. So you open your Bible to another verse and you point and it says, what you're going to do, do quickly. <laughs> also in the Bible. You say, what's your point? Your point is when the Bible's taken out of its context in which God intended it to be, you can make it say literally anything you want it to say. Right? Just because someone quotes the Bible doesn't make them right. They have to quote the Bible in context. By the way, speaking of context, I want to read a long passage for you here speaking about <clears throat> how to speak and please God. Um, in John 8, we have one of my favorite discourses of people arguing with the Messiah. And when you read it, you'll see why it's one of my favorite. But I want to read this discourse because it highlights the emphasis of God's words versus man's words. And this comes from the Messiah himself. In John 8, verse 30, we see this. And we're going to read through the end of the passage. In John 8, verse 30, he says, As he was saying these things, many believed him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So they responded and said, We are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? They were offended by his words that he would make them free. Did you catch that? Okay. All right. Is that not how often that we see God's word, we take offense, and we go, Well, I can't do that. What are you talking about? misunderstood God's intended context. Well, anyway, so Jesus says to them, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you, will, you, you really will be free. He said, I know you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word is not welcome among you. I speak what I have seen in the presence of the Father, therefore you do what you have heard from your Father. So now he throws it back at them. And they they did not like that. They said, our Father is Abraham. 
And Jesus responded to them. He said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing what your father does. So he highlights they reject, they reject his word because they don't want to follow it. And so he tells them, that you do what your father does, indicating they're the father, the, the father's the devil. And they take that very personally. They get quite upset. As a matter of fact, they change the argument on him. They just, boom, we're going to go a different direction. We don't like where you're going with this, so we're going to attack you in another way. We're going to say, um, <laughs> we were not born of sexual immorality. Now, you say, well, what, what is that an attack on? Because it was known that, that his father did not claim to be his biological father, though he married his mother. Right? It was known that, that Joseph did not claim to be his biological father. Even though he married Mary, the mother of Jesus, he did not claim to be the biological father of Jesus. So they said, we weren't born of sexual immorality like you. You came from a sordid past. We know our past. And then they said, we have one father, God. We are so thankful for our heritage and so proud of where we've come from. We don't even claim our own fathers. We look to God. You don't have a father, obviously, and you're not claiming God. We, we are under God. We, we are the righteous ones, right? And so Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature, because he is a liar and the father of liars. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I tell the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen, because you are not from God. And they don't even try to argue him on this point. They don't even try to correct him on this point. They once again take the argument in a different direction. They say, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? So as Samaritans, were half Jews. Okay, they were, they were mixed breed Jews and they were not considered worthy of being in the temple. So even though Jesus' father was not known, they're saying, well, aren't we right in saying that you're the same level as a Samaritan and you don't even deserve to be in the temple because we don't know who your father is. He could be anybody. <laughs> Maybe a non-Jew. Who do we know? We don't know. And then, and then he said, I do not have a demon on the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my glory. The one who seeks it also judges, meaning the father. The father seeks his glory and judges, right? Then he goes, verse 51, I assure you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death ever. Then the Jews said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. If you say anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death ever. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Even the prophets who died? Who do, who do you pretend to be? Jesus responded to them. He said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. My father, you say about him, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. 
And so the Jews replied to him and said, you aren't 50 years old yet and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus responded to them and said, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. And at that they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus But Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple complex. By the way, they picked up stones to throw at him because Jesus gave himself the name by which God introduced himself to Moses and the children of Israel when he said, tell them I am that I am has sent you. And in he, and in Greek, when it's, when it's, and here in, uh, in, um, let's see, I was in, in John 8, when Jesus says I am, there's two Greek words that individually mean I am and they're put together and they're only missing the conjunction that would say I am that I am. And so they knew without doubt he was equating himself to the one that they called God. You say, what's the, what's the point of this? The point of this is we talk about the significance that, or Paul talks about here of of not having error or impurity or intent to deceive, but being approved by God and entrusted with the gospel to speak in order to please God and not man. Jesus' words, along with the rest of Scripture, are the words of God. And when we give his words, we are speaking not from impurity, but from the purity of God's words. Say, why read that much scripture? Because I wanted us to see without doubt that Jesus' words are the same authority as the words of the Father. Then he says, we never use flattering speech. (coughs) Right, verse five, we never use flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives, God is our witness. The idea of flattering speech Tell you what, Galatians says this in verse in chapter one, verse ten. It says, For now, for am I now trying to win the favor of people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. Now I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel preached by me is not based on human thought. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by a revelation from Jesus Christ. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. Flattering speech tries to please people, doesn't it? Romans 16 says this in verse 17. says, Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause dissensions and obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have learned. Avoid them, for such people do not serve the Lord, the Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. One of the cautions that we all need to take from this is the preachers that we choose to listen to in our age of mass media and readily available sermons. Because just because someone is enjoyable to listen to doesn't necessarily mean they are carefully uh, communicating the word of God. You say, what do you mean? Well, it's really easy to fill up 15, 20, 30 minutes with nice sounding words that make you feel good about yourself that you walk away and you don't know any more about God than when you started listening, but you feel better about yourself and so you're like, hey, that was a a good 30 minutes. I'm happy I did that. There's nothing wrong with self-help books and self-help talks, but that doesn't make them God's word. Just because someone claims to be a preacher and claims to be a pastor and uses God in their in their presentation doesn't mean that they're actually giving the words of God. I'm not saying that they're evil. I'm not saying that they're against God. I'm not saying that God can't use them. But we need to, ha- we need to exercise um, uh, some, I can't think of the right word, but where you're, where you're careful, some wisdom in who we ascribe to as giving the word of God. And the reason is simple. It's because 
The goal as we communicate about God should be to communicate God's words and not our own thoughts. Your thoughts and my thoughts have zero eternal value and cannot save anything. God's words not only have eternal value, they have the ability to save souls from hell. But then he goes on and he says, uh, verse 7, Although we could have been a burden to you as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you as a nursing mother nurtures her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. What we see here is that Paul was reminding them that he did not take advantage of the situation God had put him in to be a burden to these people. He could have taken advantage of it because he had a right to do so. He had a right to say that as the messenger from God to have my daily needs provided for is not a inappropriate request but I'm going to reject that opportunity so that the clarity of the gospel is more powerful to you right in Matthew 8 verse uh, Matthew 4 verse 12 Jesus when he's when he called the disciples he was walking on the sea of Galilee he saw two brothers uh, Simon and uh, called Peter and, and his brother Andrew and they were casting a net into the sea and since they were fishermen and Jesus said to them he said follow me and I will make you I will make you fishers of men, or I'll make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him, right? Um, And so we see here that just by looking at the life of the Messiah, he did not say, I'm going to take what I could from you. I'm going to invite you to join me as I work and as I live. And that's what Paul was saying here. He just worked and lived and gave the gospel to these people. Right? And he says, he says, we work night and day uh, to, so, so, so as not to be a burden to you. Right? Um, and we know from Acts 18 and verse 1, when, he's, when, when, when the story of Paul is being given here, it says, after this he left Athens and went to Corinth where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy <coughs> with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them and being of the same occupation stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. And here we see Paul in a different city doing the same thing, finding somebody that knows how to do the work that he knows how to do and joining them in their work so that he's earning the money that he needs to survive. He said, but, but, but wasn't he supposed to give the gospel? He did give the gospel when he had the time. He went to the synagogue every Sabbath. Every time that he could, he went to talk to people about the Lord. But he also worked. <coughs> you say, what's your point? The point is, sometimes we care so much for our own needs that we get in the way of the gospel. And Paul is saying, you saw, and God is our witness, that we were so careful with the gospel that we did our best to stay out of the way of the gospel message. We wanted you to be focused on the gospel and not on us. By the way, for this very reason, I personally reject any message from any preacher, healer, gospel giver, whatever, who at the end of their message says, if you want to see more of this happen, send me your money. I reject the message completely. You say, but, but doesn't God use those people? Sometimes he, got, he does, but I can't tell the difference between the ones that God uses and the charlatans. You say, well, why are you being so harsh? Because they're going the opposite of what Paul says is important. What God led both the Apostle Paul and the Messiah demonstrated himself by his life. They're doing the exact opposite. And we want to applaud them and give them money and say, hey, good for you, keep going. Keep doing the opposite of what the Messiah lived and demonstrated and what Paul followed in his example. And no thanks. You say, Steve, that cuts out a lot of TV preachers. Yes, it does. I am aware of that. Once again, am I saying God doesn't use them? No, God does use them. He always uses his word when it's presented. Are there some whose hearts are truly trying to follow God? There probably are. But like I said, I can't tell the difference. 
God does, but I can't. So if, I, if you feel like, if you're like, Steve, you're picking on my favorite guy. I'm not picking on anybody in particular here. I'm going to do broad brush strokes here, okay, covering lots of different people. All right, so if you think, I got my favorite guy, we can talk about your favorite guy later. I'm not referring to him. <laughs> At least I don't think so. But he says, we, he says um, that they encouraged and comforted and implored each one of them to walk worthy of God. I mean, what, a, what an incredible statement when he says, like a father with his own children, verse 11, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. I mean, think of what an example this was. Imagine being in Thessalonica, and you had a, a respect for God, but you didn't know about his salvation, right? And along comes Paul and those with him, and, and you see that Paul and his friend Silas are beaten and bruised, and, and, their, and their bodies are recovering, and they come in and they start speaking about this new Messiah that's going to not only bring you to God, but remove your sins that keep you from God. And oh, by the way, he's bringing his kingdom under this earth and you want to be ready for when his kingdom comes. But along with that message and along with that hope, you see these guys who are hurting and are, are, are suffering. And what do they do right away? They throw themselves into work to meet their own needs. And you say, hey, do you, do, you, do, you, do you need some assistance? Do you need some money? And they say, no, we know how to work. You say, well, do you need some housing? Yes, we do, but we want to pay our way. Why? Because we want the gospel to be heard clearly. We don't want to cloud what God wants you to know. We don't want to get in the way. And think of the power of the message that was proclaimed in such an attitude. And as they saw what was happening, and so he says, when he says, we encouraged and comforted and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God, this did not come from a place of arrogance, but from a place of working together in the mud of this world. The Lord addresses this concept even a little bit further in Ephesians 4. It says we, it's, in Ephesians 4, 17 says this, Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. Did you catch that God's not going after the actions? He's saying the way that you think apart from my word is wrong. In the futility, their thoughts are futile. There's no value in them. Verse 18 says, they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. When, they, when you reject God's word, you embrace ignorance. <coughs> it says, verse 19, it says, they became callous and gave themselves over to, to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. Don't we see that in the world today? This is what the world is like that has rejected God. They're not content with their sin. They want more and more. And they're not just okay with their sin. They want you to approve of it and to, and to help them have more and more of it. But here's what he says in verse 20 of Ephesians 7. Are you ready for this? But that is not how you learned about the Messiah. That's what the world does, but that's not how you learned about the Messiah. He says, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. And because of this truth, verse 22, you took off your former way, taught um, your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, and you are being renewed in the spirit of your minds, and you put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and the and purity of the truth. And he says, we implored each one of you to walk worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. Why? Because when you know God's words, he changes the way you think and changes your futile thoughts into thoughts that have value because you're thinking about what he says. And he says, this is why we constantly thank God because, because when you received the message about God that you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as a human message, but as it truly is, the message of God, which also works effectively in you believers. 
For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you also have suffered the same things from, the, from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also persecuted us. Right, so he says you became Im- imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus because you have suffered. Your imitation of Christ is not just in your knowledge. Your imitation of Christ is not just in your giving. Your imitation of Christ is not just in your humility. But when you suffer because you love the Lord and you suffer because you say the, what God says and you suffer because his word changes the way you think and live and behave. Now you are also imitators of God's churches because you know what it's like to suffer. Jesus said this in John 15. He said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my word, they will also keep yours. Then we see this in Acts chapter 5. Now, I, wanna, I wanted to paint a picture for you here for one moment. And before we read Acts 5, and this is our closing thought. The apostles all abandoned Christ in his hour of need. Every one of them abandoned Christ. You say, why are you bringing this up? Because God wants us to understand something about our own failures. When we abandon him, he doesn't abandon us. The apostles all abandoned him, and yet he did not give them what they deserved. He gave them what they didn't deserve, which was an opportunity to come back and follow him again. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. He did it multiple times. To let them know he still wanted them, that he wasn't done with them, even though they had rejected him as their close personal friend in his time of need. And so after they had given the gospel, we see this in Acts chapter 5. They were speaking of his love and faithfulness. They were speaking of what he had done. And it says, after they called in the apostles and had them flogged. Now some of you may remember the story of Jesus that he was flogged, right? Which was the 39 lashes, or 40 lashes minus one with the cat and nine tails. That's a flogging, right? That's a... They were beaten severely, right? So they had them flogged, and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. We've done the most we can. These guys, they're they're, they're probably not going to speak in his name again. But they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the excruciating uh, nerve endings open and the blood and, and all the pain. They went out rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple complex and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Why were they rejoicing? Because they knew that now we are counted worthy even though we abandoned him. Now we get to suffer with him. He called us back because he wanted us. But now we know we actually have earned the right to be here. We've been tested, and we did not fail this time. The last time that we were tested, we failed epically. This time, we didn't fail. We stayed faithful to him. You say, what's the point that you're making? Well, the point is, when you've suffered for the name of Christ, you're joining a beautiful group of people who know exactly what that means people who love Jesus, churches, believers who have remained faithful and they haven't abandoned him, though the every reason was given to abandon him, but they did not. Why? Because he was worthy of following by faith. And when you contain, remain faithful to him by faith in the midst of the suffering, you prove that he is also worthy and you join a wonderful group of believers who understand exactly what you're going through. You say, but they didn't go through my circumstances. No, they didn't, but they know what it means to suffer and be faithful. And I believe that this message is very appropriate for us in our day and age. You say, why do you think so? 
because many believers are already suffering because of what they believe to be true about God in our culture, and many more are going to continue suffering, and, and many more are going to start suffering in new ways. You say, well, what does that mean for me? It means that when you suffer and you're faithful to God, guess what? You get to know that you, 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 you have joined a very elite group of people, those who have suffered and have not abandoned him. You say, but Steve, but I, but I did abandon him. And you know what? Just like the apostles, he's, he's, re- he's ready to tell you that he's not done with you. You say, well, but I want an opportunity to show him I love him. That opportunity will come, but first come back to him. Because he hasn't abandoned you. And one day, by the grace of God, when you suffer, you'll be able to rejoice that you also are counted worthy because of the name of the Messiah. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your word and the power it has to not only encourage us and teach us, but also strengthen us in the midst of the difficulty. Lord, I'm sure there are people here this morning who are in the midst of great suffering that no one else understands and that no one but you could even know exactly what's going on. But Father, I pray that you would give them the faith they need to continue on trusting you. Lord, to know that they have not been abandoned. And Lord, that they can continue on in faith knowing they are joining a wonderful and elite group of brothers and sisters who have remained faithful to you in the face of great persecution and suffering. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who knows in their heart, Lord, that they abandoned you, they walked away when the going got tough, they, they decided it's not worth the difficulty, but Lord, they have heard your call and they know that you want them back. Lord, I pray that you would give them the compassion and the grace they need to know your love and to know, Lord, that you are not done with them, to know that there will be time when they can demonstrate their faith and love for you by standing in the face of persecution. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.